encouraged me to begin our time with proclamation today. And now, O oh Lord, as we come into these moments, we pray that you will release the fear that holds us back. The fear of our own lives, of what our own lives are to be and to do, but even the fear of, our, of ourselves as a church. Fear of trying things new or, or becoming who you need us to be. Fear of change. Fear of new people. Fear of new ideas. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will allow us to simply rest in our identity as your children. And as together, our identity as your church. First Baptist Church. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1991, uh, the first Gulf War was going on. And three British soldiers had gotten caught in a firefight and got separated from their units. They walked for a long time in the desert trying to find where someone else that they knew were and to stay out of the enemy's grass. Eventually, they stumbled out of the desert and they ran into an American general. They were hungry, they were lost, they were tired, and they blurted out to the general, Do you know where we are? The general wasn't quite used to being spoken that way. And so he stiffened. And he said in a pretty pompous way. Sons, do you know who you're talking to? To which one of the soldiers elbowed the other buddy and said, man, we're in deep trouble now. We don't know where we are and he doesn't know who he is. <laughs> where we are and who we are. Those are important and worrying principles, isn't it? When you're trying to find a way in the new land. Like soldiers jumping out of the desert, First Baptist Church, in our 149 years, have stumbled out of the 20th century and into the 21st century, and now we find ourselves on a new corner. The corner of 39th Avenue, Northwest 39th Avenue, and County Road 241. And those two questions are going to be vital for us to live into the future. To know who are we to be? What are we to do now that we are in this place at this time? It's this question that's going to point us into a book of the Bible. Over the next several months, we're going to be focused on one book of the Bible. And I invite you to begin us to get to use to us here and talk about the book of the Bible called Ephesians. As we were coming out of our honeymoon period back in the springtime and all the celebrations of me becoming your new pastor and came our way into the summer, I was beginning to, to pray and think about where do we focus our attention in the fall, our first fall together when everybody comes back after all their trips and we begin to focus on what is it, what do we need to focus on? And I began to pray about that. And this question, this orienting question kept coming to my mind. Who are we to be? What are we to do now that we are on this, in this place and at this time? Back in July, Marsh and I were driving through the Jordanian desert, driving south through um, herds of camels. It's strange to even think that you see these things. And we're going to an ancient city called Petra. And I've got this thought in my brain about, what do we focus on, Lord? And so I began to think, well, maybe there are some books in the Bible that we could study. And I began to think about different books in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And slowly God sort of drove me to this book in the New Testament called Ephesians. And so during that bus ride, I just began to read Ephesians with all of you in mind. And I felt hopeful. Maybe this might be a book that we might need to listen to. I came back and I 
as Pastor Lindy sat down, we began to think about the fall. I said, what if we began to think about and reflect on and spend time on the book of Ephesians? We both said, that might, that might work. So then I began to do a little bit more study, ordered a variety of commentaries, began to look at this Ephesians idea. And over and over again, God continued to affirm that this book of Ephesians might be a great book for us to not just examine, not just to study, but to be absorbed in, to allow God's word to mold us. In these words, they might speak to us. And the more I listen to the commentaries, the more I realize what a powerful book the book of Ephesians is. I've got a few of the, the quotes here for you on your word of worship and on the screen here. First was Todd Snodgrass from the New NIV commentary, application commentary. Kyle said this, pound for pound. This is a pretty big statement. Ephesians may be the most influential document ever written. John McCain in his 1953 commentary says this, Ephesians is the crown and the climax of Pauline theology. Paul writes all of these books in the New Testament. This is the crown, the part we want to pay attention to. Ralph Martin interpretation commentary states emphatically, no part of the New Testament has a more contemporary relevance than the book of Ephesians. And then this last one from Timothy Gompis in his book, his commentary called The Drama of Ephesians. He says, Paul's desire in this book, Paul functions to radically alter and reorient our vision of reality. Paul wants us to inhabit a new story, to take our new and renewed set of practices, how we live out the church and live out Christ's teachings in the world, to see ourselves as a part of a radically different and outrageously life-giving story of God, redeeming the world in Jesus Christ. What a powerful book to begin to shape us, to alter our reality, to be able to see this great story that God wants us to live in, not just as individuals, but as a church as a whole. Now, the book we read, the book of Ephesians, was written as a letter. It was written to a group of churches in what we would say today is modern day Turkey, that time Asia Minor. It was written during the first century, so almost 2,000 years ago, and it gives us an inspired vision of being church that challenges and shapes us even today. It challenges us to think about what does it mean to be God's church today on this corner and at this moment? And what it's not, it's not an instruction guide. We're not going to read the book of Ephesians and say, okay, here's how we are to be church. X, Y, and Z. One, two, three, four, five. Instead, it's more like a spiritual guide. Where the book seeks to mold us into God's people. So that we can live out God's mission, God's kingdom, and the world in which we are in. And our challenge as we move into the book is to begin to listen to God's word. To release our expectations about what it means and to do church. The way we've always thought church needs to be. So that God can mold us into the people that he needs for the world today. So over these course between now and Thanksgiving, I'm going to invite you to engage the book of Ephesians, to get to know it, to allow yourself to, for it to become comfortable and familiar to you. And as we do, I think God's going to help us to think about what it means for us to be church. So I'm going to invite you to engage the book in a couple of ways. First of all, I want to invite you to prioritize our corporate worship. Over the next two and a half months, between now and Thanksgiving, I'm going to be preaching every Sunday on a piece of Ephesians. Today, the first two verses. And as we talk and reflect on those verses, it's going to help shape us as a whole church. And so, if you can't be here, if you can't make it for some reason, going to some out-of-the-town Gator game or whatever, I invite you to simply watch the, about 
20, 30 minutes of a sermon online. You'll find it on our Facebook page, on a, our new website that should be coming out soon, maybe this week, um, even um, on our YouTube channel. So just take the time, take a moment during the week. If you can't be here, I'm going to pay attention and I'm going to watch, see what, they're, what we're talking about in Ephesians this week. And then the second thing I invite you to do is read the book of Ephesians. Don't wait for us to read it here. Don't wait for me to tell you what it says. You begin to reflect on the book of Ephesians. I'm going to ask you to read it in two different ways. First of all, I want you to read the book quickly. So the book's a short book. It's something you can do and sit down and read in one reading very easily. 15, 30 minutes, you can read the book of Ephesians and get a sense of this letter that's written. So get a sense of the whole scope of what the author is writing. And then I invite you to read it slowly. Real slow. In fact, I'll invite you to read it two verses a day. In fact, if you are not connected to our quick cast, you can sign up at the um, uh, information desk in the, in the um, gathering area, and we will send you two verses a day to your phone, on your text, or to your email. And when you get those verses, what I want you to do is simply to take about five minutes and slowly reflect on those two verses. What is the author trying to say about being church in these words? It's a way for us to engage this text in a way that's beginning to challenge us and mold us and shape us to be the church that God has for us to be today. So what do the first two verses of Ephesians have to say to us today? How do they help us to set the, the, um, the, the, the direction of where we're going? So let's look at those two verses one more time. Simple, easy, but they tell us a great deal about how we are to interpret and read the words we're going to read throughout the book. Here are the words again. Paul, person who's writing, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Two, the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, letters that were sent in the ancient world, first century, 2,000 years ago, they all followed a set form. They began by identifying the, the writer of the letter, the, the person who was getting the letter, the addressee, the reader. And then they began to, then after this greeting, to follow kind of a body of the letter, and then there was always some type of closure. And so when we get to the letters of the New Testament, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, um, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, they all follow this ancient way because the, what the Christians did is they took this ancient pattern and they, modern, they made it work for them. Not only was the author and the addressee, the recipients identified, but they were identified by how they connected their relationship with Christ Jesus. Paul. Who was Paul? He was an apostle of Christ Jesus. This concept, this letter becomes a, a literary genre in the New Testament. These different books, as we mentioned, Galatians, Ephesians, <coughs> Corinthians, all contain this same type of reading where they you see who it wrote, who wrote, who writes it, who it's to, and what it's going to be about. And so when we read Ephesians, we're getting a chance to get an idea of what's about to take place. We find the reading, it tells us who's writing the letter and where it's going. We read this book based off of some of these ideas. So one of the first things we I did have to ask is who's writing this book? Right? Scholars agree that the words found in the book of Ephesians reflect the general, the great theological mind of the Apostle Paul, who writes most of our New Testament books. Ephesians is most closely connected to another book in the Bible, another letter written by Paul called Colossians. Most likely, Colossians was written earlier. 
when they come to write Ephesians, they take some of those words, they, they, they write them again, and then they expound upon them. Like, here's what I said to Colossians. Let me tell you a little bit more over here. And then we come to who is the recipient of these words. Most of us read this passage and see to the saints who are in Ephesus. For most of the centuries that people have read this, they have associated these words with Ephesus, with the church in Ephesus. There was a, it's a, it's a challenging part about that, though, because one, because when we read the passage, if Paul is writing these words, we know that Paul spent a lot of time in Ephesus. He was closely connected to it. He spent years working along beside the other Christians in town. But when he writes these words, there's nothing of the challenges or the opportunities or to the people that are in Ephesus. It has a much more general feel of the letter than it has a sense to like when he writes to Corinth. He's talking specifically about some challenges going on in the church. Here it's not quite as much. One of the reasons was discovered over the past hundred years. A new younger or older early manuscript of Ephesians was found. So it dates back to about the 3rd, 4th century. And so the, the concept when you look at the manuscripts, these Greek manuscripts of the Bible, the closer you can get to the 1st century, the closer we get to what the author is trying to say. And in this particular manuscript, guess what's left out? The words in Ephesus. So you see, I have a bracket in this. To the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful. The general idea now is that this was a letter that was written to a number of different churches. And that when it came to the church and the person, the pastor or whoever stood before them and read this letter to the congregation, they would include whoever they were writing. So if they stood up and said, Paul, apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Smyrna, or to the saints who are in Patmos. Or if you were reading it today, you could say, here's what Paul is saying, Paul, apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Orlando, to the saints who are in Jacksonville, or to the saints who are in Gainesville. This opening allows us to begin to read the words of Ephesians as if Paul in the first century is looking all the way down to us on the very edge of the third decade of the 21st century and says, here, listen to these words. Listen for how God is working and wants to work inside of you as the church. So as we read it quickly and slowly, God begins to shape us as God's people to be God's church on this corner of Northwest 39th Avenue and County Road 241 in the months just before the third decade of the 21st century. So this is the world that we are in. We don't get to choose a different time or place to be church. This is the time that God has placed us in. So for a couple of moments, let's think about the world in which we are in. First of all, we're, can you believe next year begins 2020? What an incredible time to be alive. The world we find ourselves in is a place of rapid change. Declining loyalty and trust of organizations spread all over the place. There's a low tolerance for meaningless activities. And we are experiencing massive political change, not only in our country, but around the world. Phyllis Tickle, in The Great Emergence, points out the Western world experiences massive cultural change about every 500 years. And she kind of puts those down. She says, first of all, the first century, around third, about 30 to 70 AD, where we saw the beginning of the Christian movement. The church begins and changes everything. Around 590 AD, guess what happens? The Roman Empire falls and the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, begin. Around 1054, we have the Great Schism. All of a sudden, there's a division between the East and the West Church. We have the Catholics and the 
Eastern Orthodox. And that changes everything about how people relate to one another. By 1517, we had the Great Reformation with Martin Luther. And now all of a sudden the Protestant and the Protestant Revolution and the modern era begins to establish itself. And then we have to the year 2000. We begin to witness the decrease of Christendom and we enter into a postmodern world. If you wonder why sometimes it's hard to keep up with all of the changes happening around us, that's because changes are happening so fast in exponential ways in all segments of society because they have this great world. One era is changing and a new era is beginning, but nothing has been settled. And so we have all of this transition challenges that's affecting all of us and it affects the church. As well, we live in a post everything world. It's a post modern world, a post Christian world, a post rational world, a post industrial world, a post denominational world. And while everything else is changing all around us, God brings us back to God's Word that continues to be the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We come back in the midst of everything changing. And we come back and say, well, what does the Lord say? Paul writes these words to a group of churches about how to be church in the first century. And they become words to us in the 21st century. Post everything world. And it becomes our spiritual guide. Ephesians can become our spiritual guide to nudge us into becoming the church that God desires. For me, it's an incredible opportunity to be a pastor. Because what we're witnessing is, is the, the end of something and the emergence of a new expression of being church. And it's so exciting. And so entertaining. And so I would like for you to, as we go forward into these next few weeks looking at Ephesians to reflect on a couple of questions. I put them in your order of, of worship and your, your sermon guide. The first question is this. How is being church different as we begin the 2020s than when you grew up? In reality, no matter what time you grew up, in the 20th century or the 21st century, the world is even different than it was just 10 years ago. Think and reflect upon that. And then one final part, not just about when we are, but about where we are. About the corner, about being on this corner of Northwest 39th Avenue and County Road 241. Now, about 15 years ago, God began to do a miracle in our church. And God brought us from downtown to this corner. And the number of miracles that it took for that to happen fill an entire worship service. And we're going to continue to tell some of those stories. But what the, the eventual idea is this, is that we did not end up on this corner by accident. God brought us here for a purpose. And the amazing part about this is that we live on this corner. So if we take this square to be Gainesville, we live in the northwest section. There's a southwest section and Southeast section and northeast section. You orient yourself to my very limited drawing abilities. Can everybody see it over there? So I want us to think about where we are. Because if you go to the west, out that direction, for 10 miles, you end up in a culture that's a southern Christian culture. And in that culture, you understand the words of church. You understand, um, and you probably have a, 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 an appreciation for God's word, the Bible, and you see it as authoritative. And you might also have this tendency to misunderstand the difference between the culture you live in and the Jesus that you follow. It's a challenge. All the way out here. 
But if you go 10 miles in the other direction, to the east, we end up in a post-Christendom culture. A place that's post-everything. We often describe it as secular. A place where people don't know the words to Jesus loves me. They might not have a very high appreciation for church, and church really isn't on their radar. It, they may not have a very high understanding of God's word, and they say, it's good for you to have yours, and I have mine. But at the same time, they're looking deeply and trying to figure out, what is the meaning of all of this? Why does all of this matter? Pre-2000, post-2000. We live in the emergence, on the margins, of where all of this culture comes together. And God has placed us here as a beacon of God's light and to be the church. For some, as they become, as they move into our, into our fellowship, this will mean having to construct a brand new Jesus worldview to understand what it means to surrender your life to Christ and to live in community with one another. For some who make their way into our congregation, it will mean having to deconstruct an identity defined more by culture than by Jesus. But in all those ways, what we find is how do we be church with everyone? It's where we are. As you reflect on what it means to be church, think of one more question. What makes being church on this corner unique? You know, the early church in the very first few centuries had a, a, a ritual, a practice that they celebrated when they came together. It was called the Holy Kiss. The Holy Kiss began as a practice of churches to express the closeness of people who lived together in fellowship in a church, but who came from so many different social classes. You had people who were slaves. You had people who were merchants. You had people who were wealthy. You had people who were Jewish, people who were non-Jewish. And the early church had this ability to transform, transcend gender and religious and national and ethnic divisions in order to be able to find themselves one in Christ. And so what these Christ followers did is they began to greet one another with the holy kiss to reaffirm the freedom that they found when they were in Christ together. It's pretty slanderous. People look from outside to see these people of different ethnicities and people of different social classes of being so intimate with one another in community together. And so the ritual of the holy kiss was a way of symbolizing to everyone, to the rich and to the poor, to the men and to the women, to the clean and the unclean, to the old and to the young, to the morally pure and the morally not so pure, that they were all Loved by Jesus. They were loved by Jesus beyond anything they could ever imagine. And that God's Spirit does not play favorites. So over the next three months, I hope that you will join me and join us in being shaped by the book of Ephesians. So that we may be the church that God needs us to be on this corner at this moment. And as we do so, our challenge is to give our whole community a holy kiss. To let them know that wherever they've come from, whether they've been in church or never been in church, whether they're rich or whether they're poor, young or old, whether they feel like they should never be in church because they just can't get their lives right, or whether they feel like their lives are perfect, wherever they are, they feel that when they show up in this place, they know that they are loved by Jesus far more than they can ever imagine. 
This is where we are hoping to be. To be the church that God is calling us to be on this corner at this moment. Thanks be to God. Amen.